we are now live and should be seeing people pop in soon. <laughs> there we go. I always give it give it a couple heartbeats before we um, start the introduction. Um, welcome to everybody who's coming in. Um, I'm gonna start really slow and just watch those numbers run up um, a little bit. But you are tuning in to a BookSync, uh, YA at BookSync event um, hosted by Books Inc. out in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, before we get started on our event, I want to take the time to thank everybody who's joining, including our lovely authors, um, for continuing uh, to come to our events, to um, reach out, to do events. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, Books Inc. is a large independent bookstore out in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have um, 10 locations and we have been here since 1851 um, and we couldn't we wouldn't be able to say that without the support of um, our lovely local authors and our fellow book lovers who come to events like this in person or virtual and shop with us. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for your continued support, especially during this difficult time. And um, we are so happy to be able to offer these virtual events to give you a little bit of peace and joy during this um, time when we're all so uh, secluded. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, before I jump into my intro, I'm going to do a rundown of Zoom and how it's going to work for our event tonight. Um, attendees, you'll notice that your um, audio and video are turned off. Um, we are in webinar format so that our authors are the only people you will see in here today. Um, but if you would like to um, talk to one another or talk to BookSync, you can do so in the chat. Um, that chat function is open. My coworker, Elena, who is off screen, will be um, adding any links to our author's books or um, any books that they might mention during our event today there and any other pertinent information that you might like to have will be put in the chat so you can keep that open to view. If you would like to um, ask our authors questions towards the end of the event, we will be doing a Q&A. So you can enter that into the Q&A box um, and I'll come on at the end and ask those questions on your behalf. Um, and as an added thing uh, for tonight's event, Shannon and Shana have offered to um, raffle up their books, uh, a copy of one of their books um, for a game tonight. So we'll be doing that in the chat as well. So there's gonna be lots of fun things. And here we go. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome local author Shannon Takaoka in celebration of her debut novel, Everything I Thought I Knew, the story of a teen who wonders if she's inherited more than just a heart from her donor. Joining Shannon tonight is her friend and fellow author, Shana Youngdahl, whose debut novel, As Many Nows As I Can Get, was celebrated as a dazzling, not to be missed novel uh, about love, loss, and longing. So Shannon, Shana, welcome, and I'll pass it on to you until the Q&A section. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I think we were going to start by um, just doing a quick um, read of the book, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit um, about it first, and then um, we'll do a Q&A. So, um, my book, Everything I Thought I Knew, tells the story of a 17-year-old girl named Chloe whose life is turned upside down by a heart transplant, and it causes her to question everything about um, who she is and who she wants to be. So that's basically the elevator pitch, and I'm just going to give you a couple pages from the beginning of the book. Here's the cover with the heart on the cover. Um, so let me go ahead and start. The first chapter is called Broken. Here's one of the many things I thought I knew that turns out to be wrong. You need to fall in love to end up with a broken heart. That's not how it was for me, at least not at first. Sometimes things, glass, eggs, hearts, just break, and there's no way to put them back to their exact original form. You can't stir the cream out of your coffee. A broken plate, even if you glue it, will always have cracks. This is just basic physics, or more specifically, the second law of thermodynamics, not to nerd out on you too much. But I'm already getting ahead of myself, which I tend to do, because my brain never seems to want to slow down and just be still. There's too much going on in there, especially now. So let's rewind a bit and begin with the moment that the universe decided to start messing with all my assumptions and well-laid plans, big time. October 14th at 3.45 p.m., it's the fall of my senior year. I'm running. 
damn, it's hot, I say to Emma as we round the curve at the far side of our high school's track. The lane lines vibrate ahead of, ahead of me in the heat. Halloween is a few weeks away and it must be more than 80 degrees at least. Emma, her auburn ponytail smooth and perfect, looks like she's barely broken a sweat. Is it, she asks, feels pretty good to me. A warm spell typical for the San Francisco Bay area in the fall has brought us beach weather in the middle of the month packed with college application submissions after school practices and as always piles of homework. The result, we won't in fact be hanging at the beach. Cross country is basically the only time I get to breathe outdoor air. We're doing intervals today and Emma's pace seems faster than usual. As soon as we are side by side, she pulls ahead. I have to push myself to catch her. I push, she pulls. She pulls, I push. This is starting to annoy me, even though it's what Emma and I always do when we practice together. We compete. She pulls ahead again. I try to focus on increasing my pace. Focus, Chloe, focus. But all I can think about is water. I didn't drink enough before practice. I didn't drink any water, actually. I got held up leaving seventh period because I needed to talk to Miss Brees about my paper proposal for AP Physics and barely had enough time to pull on my running shoes. My proposal is going to be late, which Miss Brees made sure to note is unlike you, Chloe, which is true, I guess, but it got me thinking about what really honestly is like me because sometimes, or maybe even all the time, I'm stumped on that one, which got me stressing again about my college application essays and whether they are mind-numbingly boring, and by extension, if I am mind-numbingly boring, which resulted in me forgetting to fill up my water bottle. This is starting to seem like kind of a big mistake now that my mouth has gone dry and I'm dizzy and feeling like I might be about to throw up all over my shoes. I turn to Emma. Her mouth is moving, but I only hear her last few words. Don't you think, she asks. Chloe. But I must have zoned out for a few seconds or minutes because I have no idea what she just said. Think about what? I barely have enough breath to get out the words. So I slow to a light jog as Emma pulls ahead of me for the third, or is it the fourth time? Instead of pushing, I just stop. My heart is thumping hard. Thump, 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 thump. It's all I can hear. Thump, 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 thump. Emma turns around. Chloe? The, line, the lane lines ahead of me look wrong. They're not just vibrating, they're rippling like those wave graphs in my physics textbook. The whole field around us is rippling. Are we having an earthquake? I look toward Emma, also rippling, who has now stopped running too and is staring at me eyes wide. Chloe, are you okay? My chest feels like it's being crushed. My ears are on fire. Sweat is running down my face and my back, soaking my shirt. Not okay, I think, definitely not okay, but I can't say the words. And then the world that's spinning like a top gets tipped over me with it. The last thing I see is the brilliant blue of the October sky overhead. The first couple pages. I'm so glad that's what you decided to read. <laughs> um, I love the opening. Um, so can you start out by just telling us, Shannon, a little bit about your inspiration and what gave you the idea for this book? Sure. Um, so I like books that, um, you know, incorporate scientific ideas. And I mean, it's one of the things that drew me to your book, which is based on um, Einstein's theory of time, as many notes as I can get. Um, but I, I read a lot of nonfiction science for inspiration. So like Scientific American, I listen to podcasts, I watch documentaries, I read nonfiction. And at one point, I can't remember exactly, I think it might have been a podcast, I heard a story about um, transplant recipients who felt as if they had somehow inherited habits or memories from their donors and um, whether or not this is like scientifically possible or not I just thought the idea was fascinating and um, I thought it would be an interesting thing to explore in a story um, especially with a character who was at an age where they were still trying to figure out who they were you know that was in a transitional period of their life so that was kind of the spark that um, got the story going and then it evolved a lot as I as I worked on it and I started to incorporate some other ideas into it, including some of the um, weirder theories around quantum mechanics. So, yeah. Um, 
yeah, I love I love all the science stuff in there, as, as you know, um, also drew me to this book. Um, and then that, I think part of the, the way you kind of get away with the weirder science stuff is because of how strong Chloe's voice is, which we just heard. Um, and when you first sent this to me, um, I got it in the mail and I was going to teach my writing for children and young adults class that day. And I read that same chapter that, that you just read to my students as an example of, of strength of voice. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you developed this voice, which allows us to believe uh, things when they kind of get strange um, and just a little bit about that process. Yeah, so that's a really good question. The voice to me is one of the trickiest and most magical parts of the writing, creative writing, I think, because, and for people who don't know exactly what we're talking about by that, it means sort of like the feel of your character or their personality or how they kind of sound. And um, it takes me a while to kind of, to get a character's voice. And, um, but once they do, that almost feels like the lock that, the key that unlocks the story for me. Um, so, you know, with Chloe, I just, or with any character, I really just start to ask myself questions. Like, is this person an introvert or an extrovert? Does this person like to joke around or are they serious? Like, what kind of music do they listen to? What, what TV shows do they watch? Whatever. And I just really start thinking about all those things and then you know, kind of funneling that into their dialogue and into how they think about the world. And so for Chloe, I definitely knew I wanted this character to be someone who was really interested in science and cared about scientific inquiry. And um, because um, she likes to have explanations for things, she likes to know why things happen the way they do. And that allowed me to set up um, you know, the conflict in the story pretty early on because things are happening to her that don't really have an explanation. So, I mean, I think that sets her off on this path in the book. So um, once I kind of figured that out, that was like a key piece of her character and that was a key part of her voice that just really helped me get the ball rolling with the book. Nice, so I wanna kind of keep delving down this idea <laughs> of science a little bit. Um, and thinking about that relationship between science and love and personal choice. So how did you find that your um, love for science kind of informed the writing process? And I mean, I think this goes back to what you were just saying about kind of Chloe's own inner conflict, right? Cause she's very early in the book, you know, shutting down her friend Jane and saying like, no, that's pseudoscience that, but it's sort of, getting in her head too. Um, so yeah, did you, I guess to state it a little more clearly, did your process mirror Chloe's at all? Or were you, you know, it sort of at different points having, creating tension with her as well? Yeah, well, yeah, I guess, I mean, if this is, this might be an interesting way to describe, I'm a big researcher myself. I mean, I think I have some of her tendencies where I like, I need to, I will over research something because I want to make sure I understand it. And, um, and in some ways that's because I'm a curious person and it feeds my creativity. And, and I think the character of Chloe is that way too, but in other ways it can be a way of um, controlling your universe in a, in a way, like you need to understand something. And I think one of the things that I wanted to explore in the book was that there's always going to be this tension in life between um, having everything figured out and knowing that there are some things that you don't have control over necessarily, or you don't te te technically understand all the way. And that's okay. And that's also like part of the beauty of the universe that there are things that are mysterious to us. So I kind of wanted Chloe to get to a point. I mean, I think that was one of the things I really thought about when I was writing it of um, being at peace with that tension. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think that's also related to my next question which is about the pressures of high schoolers. Mm -hmm. um, so I see these two as, as related a little bit, um, you know, 
they Chloe talks about how when she's young she's questioning and questioning and at some point in high school it's just about getting the A and getting into college and looking good on paper and having good grades so I'm curious as an author um, why you felt like it was important to speak to that pressure that young people often find themselves in. Yeah, I mean, I've thought about this a lot, and I know you've thought about this a lot. Your your book deals with this a lot, too. Um, I, I feel like, especially when kids get to their junior, senior year, it things have changed a lot since when I was in high school. And, you know, I just don't remember this race to, like, take every possible AP class and, you know, not just, not just like you can do a sport if you want to, you know, you need to have one for your resume, you need to join these clubs. And I, I just feel like they're under so much pressure to develop these resumes. And, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with if you want to do all that stuff, that's awesome. But I feel like there's now this like expectation. And I mean, there's so many stories about how it's burning these kids out and that there are, you know, it's why there's so much anxiety and depression and also doesn't leave room for failure either. I mean, and I think it's also tied up with not just getting into college, but because college has gotten so expensive and so competitive, there's just a lot um, on their shoulders at a very young age when they're still trying to even figure out what do I want to do with my life. And so I just really wanted to think about that and especially think about that because here we have a character gets kind of the rug pull out of her, out from under her. And, you know, when they're on that track, that's like almost like devastating to them. And I, you know, and I just, so I just really thought about that a lot when I was writing it. And I hope if anything good comes out of this pandemic is that we reset our expectations on that kind of treadmill that they go through in high school because I don't think it's healthy for them. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're totally right. These are questions that I, I also was interested in exploring. And Yeah, for sure. I, and I thought you did a really, I mean, I think was the, at one point, um, my, my daughter's high school had had a speaker talking about how, and I think you kind of look this a lot in your book of like kids being so burnt out by the time they get to college that they just go crazy in college or they just, you know, don't, you know, they're just uh, burnt out and, and um, not able to like really even enjoy learning for learning's sake as much, you know? Right. They're not deep learning, right? Yeah. They're, they're, Talk, I work, talk about this with my college students. They're about surface learning. They're about getting an A rather than having the sort of critical questioning that Chloe identifies as like having really formed her, right? Turned her into the science-minded person that she was, but then she's sort of become away from it. And it's actually this tragic event that stops everything that gets yeah. her back to her, I mean, weirdly, right? Gets her back to that sort of sense of curiosity and joy and passion that we all feel when we're like creating something exactly um, yeah yeah and like and I think the idea of that like part of learning is failing and messing up you know yeah. and yeah um let, let's see I had another question about self-identity uh and how we the way we picture ourselves this is sort of going on the same thing right the way we picture ourselves and the plans for ourselves when they take a sharp turn um, and, uh, how did you, I guess we've sort of been talking about this, but how did you make these two themes kind of go together in terms of like, you know, your life is derailed and, you know, you have an, somebody else's heart <laughs> and you're trying to kind of work all those themes into the book. Right. Right. So identity was definitely a big theme for me for many reasons. I mean, for sure, um, you know, in a very literal sense, she has a heart transplant that causes her to kind of think about, you know, who am I if I have somebody else's heart? And I, you know, I thought that was interesting to look at, but also who am I if I'm not this person who is on this path? And so I think those things worked in tandem really well when I was writing it, I just really wanted to think about um, how much we define ourselves based on um, our achievements and the things that we're doing um, 
And we do this like, you know, everybody does this a little bit and that's natural, but you know, what happens when, you know, you, you can't define yourself that way and you have to redefine yourself. And that um, I kind of really wanted to think about that life is kind of a constant um, cycle of that. Um, and uh, so that's what I wanted to look at there. And I think, I, I think that, especially at that age, um, identity just is, is such a big thing. And um, it was something that I really wanted to, to dig into with not just my main character, but I think all of my characters in the yeah. story, really, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I love her, you know, that she's always like, wait, do, do I like this? Like, is this me? She's, she's self-questioning sort of, we see her process really mm -hmm. internally throughout the book. Um, and I love the way you developed that. Um, so what's your hope that readers and especially teen readers take away from this story? Oh yeah, so there were a couple of things. I mean, I think for one, I just, in terms of this question of who am I and what do I wanna be and what am I all about? It's like, you don't have to have all the answers to those questions, especially at age 17. It's okay to not be sure. It's okay to change your mind. It's okay to experiment um, because that's just part, we, we all are constantly taking in new things and evolving and changing over time. And um, so your identity is not set in stone, you know, it doesn't have to be. And then I think the other thing that I, you know, obviously because we're dealing with issues of life and death and what all that means, I just, um, I think we kind of get, you know, so tied up in, uh, and again, this is very natural, Make, setting goals, making plans, trying to like, what, what's next for me? What's coming next? And especially at that age where they're all like looking towards like college or what they're gonna do after high school, um, that sometimes we get so wrapped up in all that, that we forget like life is lived, um, you know, to quote your title, in the now. <laughs> and um, life is fragile and unpredictable. So um, just not to forget to, to live in the present too. And I mean, every person can kind of take that advice. And, that, and then, then I think there was also something, and I, this is not quite tangible that I was going for, is that just um, there's, I, I wanted to look at the kind of um, juxtaposition between like uh, controlling our destiny and then letting go to fate and chance. And those are two, always two things that are going to compete. Um, but that's, that's okay, you know? So those are some of the things that I, that I hope people take away. And just that the universe is mysterious. I, I, I right. love, you know, I love that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I was thinking, and my next question was actually about fate. So I'm glad you, you kind of touched on that, that. So, you know, as the book goes on, right? After her transplant, Chloe's experiencing these inexplicable dreams, memories that aren't hers, you know, things she's not sure that she remembers, like somebody crying in the hospital after she's had her transplant. She believes the person's there, nobody's been there. Um, and she's doing all this research that we talked about earlier. Um, but so how did you ma manage that balance between like realistic and mm -hmm. contemporary, which the novel very much is, um, as well as, you know, this sort of like fantastical and uh, imaginative kind of surreal part of the story that um, is really bringing up those questions of fate and the, myst the vast mysteries of the universe that, you know, aren't probably going to be unraveled even in our lifetimes. Right. So um, I really enjoyed stories that do strike, bring in a sort of, uh, you know, fantastical element or otherworldly uh, element. And I always knew that the story was going to include that. But I think the biggest challenge for me was because um, the setting is contemporary and realistic in many ways, whatever, um, you know, otherworldly element I brought into it, um, I wanted to be sure I was striking the right balance. So, you know, are you do, I kind of, you know, are people gonna go along with me on this, right? So, and I think any author who writes a story like this, that's always the question. And some people aren't, <laughs> you know, gonna go along. Some people are just gonna be like, ugh, like this. But um, 
I am always one of those people that's going to go along with that kind of story. So I just decided to not worry about it too much and just write the kind of story I wanted to read and let my imagination go with it. And, and anything that seemed, but definitely my editor and um, the proofreaders and copy editors were uh, definitely keeping me in check about like, well, if this happened this way, how would this happen, you know, and timelines and all those things. So it right. definitely helped kind of help me ground it a little bit, so. Yeah, yeah, the, the timelines get messy, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot, I know. Um, so can can I ask about your path to writing YA? Like, how did you, did you know that you wanted to write for young readers? Um, did you know this was a YA novel when you had the idea? And, you know, did any, has anything sort of surprised you about being a YA author and what that means? Um, well, so when I got the idea for the book, I definitely felt right away that it was a YA idea be just for the because of how much it was about questioning and figuring out yourself and I just think that that is a good age um, to explore that so um, and I love to read YA um, it has changed as a category so much from when I mean there really wasn't a lot of YA when I was a teenager and so you know you either ended up reading like books that were a little too young or books that were like way, way too old. So um, I just think there's so much exciting stuff going on in this category. I definitely feel um, because it's young readers uh, responsibility to be thoughtful about the kind of story I'm telling for sure. But um, overall, I, I mean, I think I just, I love this audience and I love writing for this audience. Yeah. Yeah, definitely me, me too. I was also always like, hiding like I, it was like years and years of reading secretly YA as it like started to get bigger and bigger you know I'd be like these are my beach reads <laughs> and, then, and then I was finally like "Ooh, I could write that yeah. um, and of course I work with teenagers so that helps too right I love young people um, and then let's see could you just talk a little bit about your writing process um, in terms of you know do you pre-write? Do you know your story? Uh, do you just kind of let it go once you have an idea? Do you have, is it character first, idea first? So my writing process is somewhat chaotic. I, um, I am not good at outlining. I'm we sure. relate on this level. <laughs> I am in what, what people in the, in the writer community call a pantser, which means I write by the seat of my pants. So, um, I definitely do like a lot of pre-writing um, where I'll just like get a journal and kind of jot down thoughts and ideas and things like that. With this book, um, you know, I started with this idea, but I wasn't exactly sure where it was gonna go. And I started just, and then I had this idea about this character wants to surf and, you know, and I started writing and, um, at some points, I got so stuck, <laughs> like just dead in the water, you know, and um, and I realized, like, okay, I had to, I just didn't know what came next. So I wrote the, I I figured out the end, and I wrote the end. So I wrote completely out of order, um, and I think you did too. Your book yeah, is told out of order on purpose because it's based on Einstein's theory of time, but. Um, I wrote out of order and then kind of looked at what I had and started to put it together like almost like a puzzle mm -hmm. um, and that's like I mean that's the way I can do it I, I for me like I see scenes really clearly and then I connect them um, that said I am trying to be a little more organized with my next book because I think that's um, a slow writing uh, process but I'll never be the type of person that writes like a detailed you know, multi-point outline because I just have to write some of it before I even understand these characters or have know what their voice is like or anything like that. So I have to write for a while to just kind of figure it out. Yeah, totally. Me too. I, I just, it's hard for me to know, um, you know, how something is supposed to even start, right? 
like that's the that was the hardest thing I mean I think now it's had three or four different beginnings you know and <laughs> I wrote it all I wrote it all out of order and then I put it all in order and then I put it all out of order oh my gosh. many times to get it to the final order that the book is in um and I had to go through that to kind of get there and um this next one has been a little more but only slightly more kind of organized <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'm the same. I wrote, I rewrote the first chapter multiple times. Like, well, I think the first chapter originally is like chapter four now. Right, right. Things like that. So, um, like, I, I think it's really hard until you get to the end of the story, really, to even see. Um, sometimes then it's easier to go back to the beginning and go, oh, okay, this, these are some of the ideas I want to thread through the beginning, you know, so. Um, but that said, like everybody has different process. I think it's really depends on your personality and there's not, I mean, there's really no right way to write a book. Yeah. And maybe the book you're working on too. I mean, I feel like probably each one teaches you how to write it, right? Exactly. The, the book yes. that it is. Um, I'm curious about your chapter titles too. Um, if you don't mind. Oh yeah, so my chapter titles, I just, well for me, chapter titles were almost like mini, um, mini book titles. You know, I kind of just looked at them and thought about the theme of each, because I look at each chapter as sort of like a, a mini story, right? You have like this little arc in each chapter. So I just tried to go through each one and pick out what the theme, what I thought the theme was or picked out a word that, that worked. I know some people just number their chapters, but I ended up being, where are yours numbered or yours titled? No, my, no they aren't tight. Well, they're sort of tight. They're like titled by the time. By the know? time, Like right. six weeks ago and, and the location because we're, we have two, you know, two different road trips happening and lots of different times. So, and then there's like now and the location, but um, mm. I like, I'm always impressed by people who chapter give chapter titles because to me they're like little poem titles or something you know they're fun kind of yeah I, I like that idea so but I, I, I it's not like I I don't think I really set out to be like I'm just definitely gonna do a chapter title I, I don't think I realized that some people just number them so I needed them <laughs> <laughs> anyhow um so what are you reading now um, so what am I reading now? I am reading, I've been reading a lot of the books that came out in 2020 from our, uh, Shane and I are both, we're both in, um, a debut group of writers who came out in the last, in 2020, well, yours came out at the end of 2019, but, yeah. um, so let's see, gosh, I've got like a whole stack. I can't, I'm gonna have to cheat because I'm like, whenever I get asked a question like that, my brain freezes. Here's some of the really good ones I've read this year. Um, <laughs> a Jen Moffat's book, Those Who Pray, just oh, yeah. came out about, uh, a, a girl who gets caught up in a cult. Um, here we go. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, a nonfiction I would definitely recommend right now is uh, there's a, a writer in our debut group named Cindy Otis who wrote True or False, and it's a guide for young people to identify fake news, which is seems very needed right now. Um, there uh, are three books that deal with um, uh, gun issues. One was um, uh, The Lucky Ones by Liz Lawson, which is great. Accidental by Alex Richards and um, Three Things I Know Are True by Betty Colley, which is just a beautiful book written in verse that I just love so much. It's really pretty. Um, this is My America by Kim Johnson was is great. Um, Chloe Gong, who wrote, uh, she wrote a fantasy set in 1920s Shanghai called These Violent Delights, which was really good. Um, and there's more that I could tell you, but uh, how about you? <laughs> yeah, I've also been reading a lot of 20, 20 debuts. That's why I have Jen's book right behind me here. Um, uh, I read, um, let's see, I'm, I'm also like trying to crane up my bookshelf here to, re to remind myself um, of titles, but uh, escaping books like uh, Jenny's Hood, which is a feminist Robin Hood. That's a really good to sort of get you out of your life. 
um, uh, Helena Fox Oz's How It Feels to Float is just gorgeous. I loved that one. Um, and Raquel Vasquez, Jilly Lenton's, oh, what is it? Sia Martinez and the Moonlit Beginning of Everything is fantastic. I actually hope that book is widely taught. Um, really good. Uh, she's a poet and uh, it's not written in verse, but you can tell that it's informed by her poetry. So I love that one as well. All right. Definitely pick up some books from uh, the last year. All, every, all the authors who had books come out last year, it's been quite quite an interesting year to debut a book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Do you wanna say anything about that process and how things kind of got derailed? Um, you know, I think maybe? all of, <laughs> like what we're doing right now, all of us pivoted uh, to online events. And I mean, I think there's been some, uh, you know, I love meeting people in person. So it was kind of sad I didn't get to do that this year, but, um, but events like this allow authors and um, readers to connect that wouldn't be able to in person. So that's nice too. Um, yeah, it's been, an, it's been an interesting, my book came out like two weeks before the election and um, it was, it's just been an interesting year. I think we're all a little distracted and all that, but um, you know, uh, as we talked about um, adapting to change is part of life. So that's what we're all, that's what we're all doing, you know, so. Yeah. And escape um, reading is a really good thing. Yeah. <laughs> For it's sure. Good, it's good to have a book that takes you away. Yeah. Hi, Anna. I think we're ready for the um, the audience questions in a minute. Um, just for just a note, sorry, my lighting is so bad now this evening. Um, if you're interested in the books that they are recommending, uh, Elena is trying to get them into the chat as quickly as possible. Um, click the link because when we hang up the call, the chat will be lost. Um, so if you're interested in any of those recommendations, check the chat and start clicking those links. Um, but uh, we do have some questions, but I know first, um, Shannon, you wanted to do a little giveaway uh, game, um, which will also take... Um, place in the chat. So if Elena pauses for a quick second <laughs> on searching for those books, um, we can all um, watch the chat for Shannon's little giveaway. So Shannon, I'll pass it on to you. Okay. So um, uh, Shana and I will give away uh, a copy of our book to the winner. Um, so here's how it's going to go. Um, music's a big theme in my book. And there's one scene in the book where a character um, creates a playlist of songs with the word heart in the title. Um, so if someone, well, the first person to guess one of the songs that appears in the book will be the winner. And then um, we'll figure out something if nobody guesses, but I think someone will probably guess, so. So just guess, guess um, songs with the word heart in the title. And we'll okay. give you about a minute. To... Oh, okay, I got it, Kath, Kath. <laughs> Who was it? Kath, uh, <laughs> Total Eclipse of the oh, Heart. Nice. That's a great guess. Nice. Yes, is, um, is in the book. And before you guys think that is not a YA type of song, it is a character's dad who created the playlist. So I just... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I remember uh, yes, totally in high way. school, we had some presentation with that song in there. So it, to me, it's a high school, it's a YA song. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, congrats, Kat. Um, either Elena and I will reach out to you to get your uh, shipping information from you. Um, if we don't get it before the event um, wraps up, we'll email you. I'll write your name down right now. Um, based on what you registered with. So we'll get a hold of you and make sure we can get those books to you. So congratulations, Kat, thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, and if you have, again, if you have more questions, um, please enter them into the Q&A box. I did see a few pop up in the chat, so I'll try to get those as well. Um, hopefully they weren't lost, um, but I'll start off. Um, let's see. We talked a little bit about the process of writing. So um, I know someone asked in the chat, I'm gonna skip the Q&A really quick because um, we were just talking about it, Shannon. Um, someone asked how 
uh, the pandemic and everything involved might have changed your process and what that experience looked like for you. So I think they would like to have you um, elaborate a little bit more from what you said. Yeah. Let's just make sure. Yeah, what was your um, writing now and has the pandemic affected your process? And this is from Mindy. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I, I love to write in coffee shops and libraries and um, uh, it, you know, I, I live in San Rafael. There's a bunch of amazing libraries here in Marin and I used to just kind of skip around to different libraries depending on my mood. We have um, the Civic Center Library here in San Rafael is where they filmed the movie Gattaca, which is a sci-fi movie with Ethan Hawke, right? So that's one is like a good, like a little kind of futuristic spot. And then there's one in Mill Valley that's just like surrounded by redwood trees and when it rains it's just like so pretty in there so I really miss doing that I miss going to a coffee shop because sometimes I like to have a little like activity uh, almost white noise around me and um so I really miss that and um also like many parents I'm home with the uh, kids doing their school at home it's just you know a little my husband's home work it, it's just a little distracting here but um no, I'm doing my best. So it's 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 definitely changed up my routine um, a bit, um, and I think that you know all of us have have been adapting our our work routines in a way. But uh, I'm still going, still still trying to get words on the page for sure. Yeah, that's a theme. Still going. <laughs> still going. It's a theme. That's the mantra. Um, so I think we have some people who are interested in writing or we have some writers in the group. So a lot of your questions are about the writing process. Um, I have another question here from, oh, I'm losing it because it's in the chat. Um, someone asked how many drafts you had to do um, for, for your book. Um, I lost count. <laughs> so, um, and I think the way to look at it, at least in my experience, is um, there's multiple, multiple drafts. But, you know, as you go, it ends up being you're not redrafting the whole book over and over so many times you're addressing certain issues. So, you know, I think in the beginning with your first draft, for me, at least with the first draft, I'm definitely going back and almost like rewriting with that second draft. But, but then it's like, okay, your big picture changes. So, you know, I will be working on these, you know, so many chapters or this character's through line or whatever. So I think it's just, I mean, I kind of like think of it like a, a painting in that, you know, your first draft is this little sketch and then you start broad brush, you know, strokes on it. And then, you know, by the time you're getting close to the end, you're doing a, like real detailed work where you're, you're fixing stuff at the sentence level or the line level, um, you know? And so it's just like mul it's multiple layers in a way. Yeah, so it was a lot of drafts. I have lost count. I have no idea how many, how many, <laughs> how many yeah, times. I I never know either. And I also like, sometimes I'm like, what do people call a draft? Does it mean like you got to the end once, but you <laughs> like, I, like the whole idea of draft has become really slippery to me lately. I don't, I'm not really sure. I'm like, is a draft when I am willing to show somebody else or is it the seven things I do before that or however many, I, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I don't <laughs> even name it them drafts. I just date every revision, like, so anytime I change it, I just save it under a new date. So I know like I'm working with the most recent version of, <laughs> of the book, yeah. Um, let's see, uh, we'll keep it on the writing process. So um, someone, it's anonymous, asked, um, what was your favorite part of the process of writing and bringing this book to market and your least favorite part? My favorite part of the process, um, you know, I really enjoyed working with an editor, uh, with my editor. She, her name is Kaylin Adair with Candlewick Press and she was amazing. And we just really clicked on what we wanted the book to be. And it was nice, it was so nice to have um, someone kind of 
teaming up with me and helping me make it better. And I will say this, my agent too is a very good, um, she has a great editorial eye and she really helped me as well. So, I mean, that kind of collaborative process, I, I really did um, like, uh, and I like revision. I hate drafting, like it's once the draft is there, I like shaping it. So I actually enjoy that part. Um, uh, so yeah, I would say that's my favorite part in terms of like the whole process. I mean, publishing a book is, um, it's, it's a slow process. So you have to be patient. Like, you know, I mean, like Shana's next book is coming out in like 2023. I, I sold this book in 2018 and it came out in 2020. So, you know, it's just, um, you have to be patient. And I always tell writers, um, I know I'm giving, you know, I think we all need to take this advice when you're writing is always be working on other stuff, you know, because, you know, the one thing is gonna have, have times where you don't touch it at all. And, you know, use that time to work on a new thing or new ideas and things like that. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, and it's like, it's sometimes it's a little daunting to put yourself out there and, uh, you know, do book marketing and things like that, but it's also fun too. But. <laughs> uh, Shana, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I will second the, the wonderful surprise of working with an editor and agent team and just feeling like you have these other people who are really invested in your creative work um and want to make it the best thing possible I mean I just I really thrived um I think just having knowing that I had that investment um and working with my my editor uh Jessica Garrison at Dial was absolutely fantastic um and you know I get chills thinking of like getting to do it again <laughs> like it's really really was a highlight um and anything that was you know I I don't I, I think, you know, I would also second the like working, like it was actually really hard for me with this one to be working on a book on the second one while, you know, I work full time, I have two kids, <laughs> like, and then I had all of this kind of anxiety about this, the first book, because I think it becomes a big thing. Um, and so, you know, just kind of, I've definitely learned to kind of like chill out and just be working on like lots of things and know that, that the process is slow. Perfect. Well, that um, kind of leads us into the next question, um, which is, um, do, have you gotten any great advice or notes from your editor that helped with the book and or how did it change from going on submission to being published? So, can you? Yeah, well, so definitely, like, like I said, you know, the way that it usually works is when, you know, your book um, is uh, selected for publication, your editor will, you'll start off what they call a developmental edit and your editor will send you, you know, a, a pages of notes, you know, a, in terms of what, what to work on. And I, like I said, really enjoyed that process. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question? Yeah, so um, it was, um, how did the book change from um, going into submission to being published? it changed a lot. So my, I write short. So I, I, my word count is, um, I'm not one of those people who like has so many, uh, pages that I need to cut. I have just barely enough. So I think I added 20,000 words during the revision process, which is a lot of, like, that's probably what, like 40 or 50 pages. I want, so yeah, there was a lot of new material or scenes that were pretty, um, you know, bare bones that got expanded. And it's just really, um, like I said, I think it got to that point where like the level of detail and color that got put into those revisions really made it a better book. So I was like kind of shocked that's how much more, you know, how much longer the book ended up getting in, in revision, but it was, it was definitely, it made, definitely made the book better <laughs> for sure, <laughs> yeah. When I got sent, and they were digital, they were sent to me digitally when I got sent my past pages, so the formatted book, and I realized that I'd written a 417 word book, I almost fell over. Like, I, I was sort of aware of the word count, that the word count had gone up at some point, but I was like, 
wow, that was a really long book. Like I wrote a really long book. Um, so I also expanded, um, but I think I maybe did a little more expanding and contracting because I tend to write long and like love to cut. Um, so I love, like I get really excited about cutting. So I overwrite, overwrite, and then I cut, cut, cut. Um, so one of the main thing, big things I did in Nows is that originally Scarlett had two best friends at home who were kind of, you know, they were like the group, part of the group of friends. And um, I just, I, I kept working, trying to get these two characters right and get the balance of the three girls. And finally I was like, I don't need two friends. <laughs> so <laughs> one disappeared and I merged them together, kind of streamlined that character. And it was like, click, 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 click. All the scenes with this character just totally fit. Um, so, you know, that, so I did do some things like, you know, losing a, a fairly major side character, um, writing whole new scenes with the, the love interest, um, you know, f filling out kind of her life at college. So there's like her life at college and her life, um, it, her last year and last summer in high school. Um, and I was so in love with this sort of tragically flawed love interest that it was always so easy to like be there with him and write more stuff with him. And then the scenes at college, which are sad in their other ways were a little harder for me to get into. So um, I spent a lot of time with those in revision. All right, we have one more audience question here. Um, and this is from Alex who asked the previous question as well. Um, and I think it's geared towards Shannon. Um, Alex asks, um, you have a teen, right? Do you ask them for advice or to read your work for authenticity? <laughs> um, not to read, uh, well, for authenticity, sometimes I'll just say like, would someone say something like this? And she's like, she will tell me the, the unvarnished truth, like, no, like, you know, so she's definitely helpful that way. Um, not necessarily story advice. We kind of keep a separation here of like church and state at my house in terms of that. So like, but um, yeah, for, for sure, I'll just, if I have a, a question or, or even about like things like as simple as like, would you take this class in junior year or, you know, or was this a sophomore year class? Like sometimes I had to, you know, cause I couldn't remember back to when I did that. And it, things have changed obviously too. So, so yeah, she does, she does sometimes give me a, a gut check for sure. Yeah. Like, did you ask phone questions? Like, is it really that quick of a, <laughs> of a response? And <laughs> <laughs> you always have your phone in your hand. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, do teachers recognize it? Um, I did have um, one of my own questions for you because um, I'm a huge, um, I listen to music when I read. So I'm wondering if you listen to music while you wrote and if that influenced the, um, the, the playlist in your book. Um, I cannot listen to, I can only listen to like um, instrumental music when I'm working. I, I, there's something about hearing lyrics that really just, I can't process that and writing words at the same time. I do use music a lot though when I'm in the idea phase. So, you know, I think for me, a lot of my writing happens when I'm not like writing. It happens when I'm out on a hike. And so or whatever, and I'm thinking, you know, like really I'm daydreaming about the story. And that's where music came in a lot for me. Like I definitely make playlists that give me um, like an emotional feel for, for whatever I'm working on. And I love doing that. And I'm always looking for songs that kind of, you know, in some way, um, speak to me on, on a certain level. So, um, and then a few of those did end up you know, mentioned in the book, in addition to Chloe's dad's playlist. <laughs> Dana, how about you? Um, yeah, I, so I can listen to music when I'm drafting. Um, but after that, after that, I rarely do. And, and my kids actually make fun of me because I put in headphones, but I don't, I don't put anything on them. <laughs> just write with headphones in um, so that I don't hear them as much. Um, but so I, it, yeah, music is, I mean, music is important in this book too. It's mentioned a lot. David has a, an old um, 
Volvo with only a tape deck and he's like collects old tapes. Um, and so, you know, I was sort of thinking about that, the ways in which kind of our music changes as a result of like the technology that we grow up with, you know, so like the difference between me having to like record things on a tape from the radio um, to my kids being like, Taylor Swift has a new song and we're watching the lyric video. It came out at midnight. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, I think those, I think those things are part of the world that we're writing in as well. That's true, yeah. All right, well, I think, um, yep, that was our last uh, question. Uh, thank you, Shannon and Shana. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, and I appreciate you coming to Books Inc. Um, for this event um, and thinking local. Um, for our attendees, if you haven't gotten your book already, you can get it at any Books Inc. location or online. We do ship nationwide and to Canada if you are not local to the Bay Area. So um, follow those links and support Shannon and Shana and Books Inc. an independent or shop at your local independent bookstore wherever you are. Um, so thank you again. I hope you all have a lovely night. Um, we're getting some love in the chat for you. Um, so a fantastic event. Um, and hopefully we see you on your next projects um, in a year or two, <laughs> whenever they're ready. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. Um, everyone have a great night and we'll see you around. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you. Us. thank you so much. Thank you.